Well, I would like to, uh, I guess it's time we should bring out our guest because we have a, a very special guest. Like I said, I'm really, really happy to, to have this guy here. He, uh, he uh, will talk to him. He spent a long time in prison. He's out now and he's giving talks. So please make our guests feel welcome. Freeway Rick Ross. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Good, thank you for coming. Would you like some water? Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> okay, good. You know, because you wouldn't want this done beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Here you are, Rick. Thank you very much. You know, it's, you know, I don't know why. I guess like, we, we had to be careful of the budget on this show. And they're like, look, the, the water's going to cost you 1500 I'm like, look, I'll do it when I get out there. Um, so uh, where did you grow up? Uh, Los Angeles. And uh, what, what kind of uh, places you grew up, what kind of neighborhood? Uh, I grew up in South Central and it was at the time that gangs were just starting and um, a real interesting time in, in American history. Which was what, you grew up in the, the mid 60s, early 70s? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was born in 60, uh, we moved to LA from Texas in uh, like 63. Okay, so the gangs were, what, what gangs were around you when you were growing up? Uh, the Crips. Oh, it was just a, I don't know why I'm acting like the gangs interact happily. Like, oh, yeah, the Bloods and, Bloods and the Crips Which, lived on one floor. It of started off as the Crips, and then later on, uh, a few years later, then the Bloods uh, are formed. Oh, they weren't even in existence then? No, the Crips were before the Bloods. Okay, so the whole neighborhood was those guys. So were you kind of expected to uh, just to, to join that? Was that kind I of like understood? I was planning on being a gang member. You planned uh, on it? When I was like mm, 10, 11, uh, my goal was to be a gang member as soon as... I got it from under my mom's eye. Oh, okay. That was, was my plan. Was she, did she hate the gangs? Yeah, yeah, she wasn't going for it. Were, were they, because gangs are so violent now. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that back then that, that they were happy-go-lucky, but were, like, were, were things as uh, violent back then as they are now? Well, it used to be more fighting than, than guns and, and uh, when in L.A. it's guns. Yeah. They don't really use knives. <laughs> no. And well, they can't really do drive-bys in New York just because, you know, it's like you're, fucking, you're around the corner, you're stuck in traffic. You know, drive-by... <laughs> Drive-bys in New York are a bad idea, you know? Pow! <laughs> me, 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 <laughs> But L.A. is very, very scary for that. So what kept you out of that? Because, uh, you know, knowing the life that you, you went on to lead, I'm amazed that you didn't get involved. Well, I got lucky. At 12 years old, I started playing tennis. I was introduced to tennis one day. Uh, I was at the park, and a guy put a tennis racket in my hand, and I fell in love with the game of tennis. So all right, I've never heard anyone before who went on to Drug Empire from tennis. That's amazing. Well, it's, it's a long story. Okay, how, what, so you started playing tennis and, and you were I good. played tennis up until 18 years old. Okay. Uh, uh, when I was 18, it was time to go to college. My skills were good enough to go to, sc to, go to college. My tennis skills were. Uh, but I couldn't read or write. I had never learned how to read or write. Now, uh, were you dyslexic? No, uh-uh. Okay, you just, you just didn't, you weren't good in school? I couldn't get it. I, you know, okay. I couldn't figure out what it was I was supposed to do in school. Um, and I just found myself wandering through school. How did you get by then? Not, I mean, I know schools will pass people sometimes, but how would you react if you had to, like, read in front of the class or? No, no. Instead of reading in front of the class, I would get swats, go to the principal's office, have to go stand in the corner. Oh. Anything was help embarrass myself in front of the classroom. Okay, so you I mean, to... it's embarrassing to be, to be considered dumb and illiterate. Um, you're telling me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Lena, you're you know the, the kids will make fun of you, so, uh, so I hid it from everybody. You hid the fact that you were illiterate by just fucking off and just going Yeah, to... I'd rather be the, the class clown than, than to be considered uh, uh, dumb and stupid and, you know, all the other things that go with being... Uh, yeah, there's no way to stand up and go, look, I can't read or write and have the class go, okay, somebody help him. You know, I mean, that's just not... <laughs> So uh, you avoided gang life at an early age, but at, at the age of 10 or 12, what happened that you actually didn't do it? How Because I, I understand from your point of view, tennis, you didn't get involved, but how does the gang accept you not getting involved? Well, when, once I started playing tennis, I was no longer really in South Central. Uh, I spent my uh, later teens in, in the tennis world, you know, tennis courts most of the time, or going to tennis tournaments, uh, practicing. Uh, usually when I finished practicing, I would... Uh, be out of the area, and then I would come back in the South Central around 8 o'clock at night, 7 o'clock at night, uh, catch the bus home. So it really 
put me in a, a total different environment, different than even my brothers and my sisters, because they didn't play tennis and all of them uh, were part of gangs. So this was kind of a way out of, of, of this bad environment or this dangerous environment. Was it was. Great, what stopped you? What happened? Because uh, I, I, you were a good tennis player, and then why'd you stop? Well, when you can't read or write, you can't go to college. And the only way I could pursue a tennis career was by going to college, because I didn't have the money to, uh, to join the circuit and start playing against the pros. So if, had you been able to read or write, you would have went to college. You could have played tennis. Correct. And this whole... Isn't it weird how one little... I mean, not that, you know, reading and writing is a little decision, I don't mean, you know, but it's like this one moment in your life, like, had they just said, okay, we'll, we'll help you get to the pros, we'll help you do whatever, this whole other thing would not have happened. Possibly, But, no. but how do you go from, uh, were you involved in any type of uh, criminal stuff before that? Like, did you do any other type of stuff before? No, no, not at that time. I'd never smoked weed, had never drunk beer or alcohol. I mean, I was a, a dedicated athlete. I had dedicated my life to tennis. I ran three times a week, uh, sometimes five miles. Uh, every time I ran, and, and I was a dedicated athlete. And did people in your neighborhood do you play tennis and they were cool with it? And they laughed at me, you know. They oh, that's a sissy sport. Yeah. yeah. So you, you all of a sudden realized, okay, tennis is not going to be my life. So what, are, what did you plan from there? Well, I went back to my neighborhood. Now I found myself in South Central, not at 7 o'clock at night, but all day, every day. And uh, eventually what I did is start hanging out with the guys that uh, I went to elementary school with, that I went to junior high school with. And these guys were doing some of everything. Gang banging, selling, uh, at that time the drug of choice was uh, angel dust, um, pimping. Uh, I mean, it, it was just like a madhouse. So you, but, so you knew a lot of these guys your whole life? You, you know, oh, I grew up with them. I went to elementary school and junior high school. Are you just not, I'm sorry, are you, are you just not allowed to, like, like, if you say I don't want to be in the gang, they're, they're okay with that? Uh, some people. Some people they are. Uh, with me, I was fortunate enough because my brothers and sisters were a part of the gang. Oh, okay. So if one of your family members are, are part of the gang, then you can get a pass, what they call a pass, meaning that you can coexist inside of their community and they won't bother you. So you come back now and you're spending a lot more time there and a part of you is thinking, like, I should get involved or do they just kind of happen? You know, you, you start to be around a certain thing and then you kind of get immune to it, you know, where it's not really, it doesn't bother you anymore. You know, like when I played tennis and my brother smoked weed and, 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 and angel dust, it was like, man, you crazy. But then once you start hanging around them all the time, it's like, oh, it ain't so bad, you know. Uh, they be whacked out their mind for a little while, but then they come back too. So you just kind of get immune to that environment and that environment starts to wear on you. Did you have any, like, or see any violent interactions at that point? You must have seen uh, some stuff happen with all Oh, those. lots of violence in my life. Um, um, starting when? Well, um, I witnessed my mom kill my uncle at about four years old. Uh, what happened? Uh, my uncle came home. He was drunk and in a rage, and um, he started to stab his wife. And my mom stepped in and, and tried to break it up. And... Um, my uncle had already knocked her eye out, and she had told him to stop and pulled him off of my auntie, uh, which was his wife, and then he pulled a knife on my mom. So my mom grabbed his wife and got her behind him, and um, I was standing right there on the side of her when, when, when she started to shoot him. So she had a gun, and she just she killed her own brother? Yeah. Well, when did he knock her eye out? That, that's... That happened obviously prior, but prior. Like, how, yeah. how were they still interacting after that happened? Uh, I mean, I guess she forgave him. You know, I was still young wow. uh, at the time. Uh, and I don't remember him knocking her eye out, but I know that that's what happened um, by her telling me that. Oh, okay. And um, what other criminal enterprises before you got into the drugs with these guys did you wind up doing? Because you said like they start, you started to get into other things. Still in cars. Oh, oh you did? Okay. Started off stealing cars, you know, uh, they would go out and steal a car and they would say, man, you want to make 50 bucks? And I would say, yeah. And they would say, okay, drive this car over here. And I started off driving the car and then later on I learned about uh, cocaine from there. The same guys stealing cars are the same guys doing cocaine. Yeah. yeah. And you start on a pretty low level. Like, I never dealt drugs. I did a very, you know, small amount compared to what I'm, I'm sure you saw. But like, what is, the, what is the process? How do you say like, okay, I'm gonna start selling it like, and not try it yourself? Because I know if I had like a bunch of Coke, I'd probably sniff it, it looks like fun. Well, you know, the first day, <laughs> the 
The first day that I got started, my friend gave me what's called a $50 piece. And it was about the size of a match head. Um, I mean, you could barely see it. And I couldn't believe it was worth 50 bucks when he told me uh, because I was totally novice. I never saw cocaine, had never used it. Uh, that was the first day I ever snorted cocaine or ever touched cocaine or anything. Oh, you tried it? Yeah, okay. yeah, I tried it. Um, so I took it home and I started asking people, was it cocaine and was it worth 50 bucks? And then eventually I ran into a guy who was a pimp. He took it, looked at it, and cooked it up, made a rock out of it, and told me that it was definitely cocaine. Uh, so people were smoking cocaine back then? They were smoking then, yeah. Was this before crack or no? Well, we never called cocaine. I mean, we never called it crack. Uh, that was what the government named it after uh, they put this big conspiracy together to make it uh, appear a certain way. Uh, and I think that they gave it the name crack because it more sensationalized the danger of it. Uh, we used to call it Ready Rock. Ready Rock. Right. When Richard Pryor was smoking, he was smoking Ready Rock and those type of guys, they were smoking Ready Did Rock. Did you know Richard Pryor? No, I didn't know him. Okay. I wish I would have. Yeah, me time. too. I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just figured, I probably, Rick and I have probably not crossed that many paths, but you know, we both like Richard Pryor, so I'm kind of happy. <laughs> <laughs> At least we had, we had that. All right, so you get involved. What, what happened with that original uh, $50 bag? How much money did you make from it? Well, you know what? He beat me out of that, that first piece. He beat you what? It was, uh... Well, it was so small, right? So he tells me to let him sample it. So he takes a sample, he cuts it in half, and he takes a little piece, he puts it on his pipe, he smokes it, and he, he tastes it, and he goes through this little ritual that, uh, that they go through. And uh, then he said, you know what? I taste it, it tastes all right, but I need one more hit to make sure that it's good. Because I don't know if it's cocaine <laughs> or not. I'm not sure if it's cocaine, and I don't want to go around trying to sell somebody something and beat them out. I take money in now. Right. In L.A., you know, I saw a person get killed one time over $1. What happened? Well, uh, they were arguing over a dollar, and then one of the guys pulled out a gun and, and shot him because he owed him a dollar. What, uh, what, do you know it what, wasn't about the money. It was the principal. Oh, yeah. No, I know. But, I, I, <laughs> 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 but I'm wondering, who remembers, hey, that guy owes me a dollar? <laughs> okay, so... You, so you got, uh, this guy is smoking. You had a guy trying your Coke to make sure it was Coke. Yeah. And then you realized the error probably of allowing a, a drug addict to test your Coke for you. Right. <laughs> so he had a little bitty piece left and he was like, man, you might as well just let me do all that and I'll pay you Friday. Oh, okay. I'll pay you Friday. <laughs> did you, so was that the first lesson? Never believe that they'll pay you Friday? Exactly. So what did you do now? You, you're out 50 bucks. I'm out. I'm out of the business. I don't know what I'm going to do. I owe my other friend 50 bucks. So I'm sitting on my porch and I'm figuring out, now, now what are you going to do with your life? You just run your first endeavor in the cocaine business. And then the guy who, who just beat me out to 50 pulls up. He jumps out the car and he has another pimp with him. And this guy said, man, can you get me $100 worth of that stuff that you just sold Martin? And I said, I don't know. Let me see. So I called up Mike, uh, who was the guy I got it from. And he said, OK, I'll bring it over to him. And that was my first sale. Okay, because you kind of, uh, you, didn't, you didn't give him the drugs up front, so there's no way you were going to get beat. He had to pay for them when the drugs right. arrived. Right, the second time they paid for it up front. So. Okay, so you start with $100, $50 you get beat, and then you do $100. Where does it go from there, and how does it... Well, I started doing that for Mike over and over again, you know, just calling him when people come, calling him when people come, and now I'm starting to know five drug users. So I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, wow. You're making Mike $300 every day, and you're not getting anything out of it. Because I really was just doing it as a favor to him. And then it just popped in my head that maybe you should start your own business. Wow, that's amazing to me that you got beat the first time. <clears throat> then you just did favors and kind of made connections. <laughs> Knowing where you went on to, it's like this business savvy just kind of clicked in. Like... It just started clicking in. And, and, you know, I started with $125. I went to Mike with $125, and I started with that. And... You know, doubled it up and doubled it up. And next thing you know, I got $1,000 and then $2,000 and then 10000 And um, Because when I first started, I only wanted to make $5,000. Oh, you just said make a little bit of money? Yeah, I said, oh, you know what, I'm going to make $5,000, get my car running, you know, give me some tennis lessons, get my tennis career back on track, and uh, I'm going to be out of this, right? <laughs> well, I made 5000 and then now when I make the five, I'm making $600, $700 a day. So I'm saying, wow, can I, why don't I just make 20? Yeah. So then when I get up to 20,000, I'm making 2,000 profit a day. So I'm like, wow, let's go get 100. 
and then I make the hundred thousand, and it's like a hundred thousand. How often? Maybe a week. Yeah, that's a lot of money. <laughs> wow, that's a really it, you know it's it's so funny. Like, it's so easy to say, you know. I mean, everyone knows drugs are bad, but it's always like, why do people get involved in drugs? And it's like it's really hard to probably not take the temptation of a hundred thousand. I'm sober since I'm 18. I'm 45. I would sell drugs for $100,000 a week. That's a lot of money to ask someone not to make. Yeah, it is. And, and especially for somebody like me who would have been, I would have been willing to work for $500 a week or $300 a week even. I just wanted a job. I wanted to, to feel like I was viable, that I was bringing something into the household. You know, uh, your mom get on you about not having anything going on for yourself. And, you know, people really look down on you if you don't have anything going on. So... I desperately wanted to get something going on. I couldn't get a job at McDonald's or the gas station because I couldn't fill out the applications. But with the drugs, they don't ask for the application. All they care about is, do you work hard? Are you an honest person? And are you going to do what you're supposed to do? But it is, uh, it is honestly, and I really mean this, we've been fucking around and having fun, but you are a guy I wanted to talk to for a long time. You are an icon. I've known your name for many years. And uh, watch this package. Do you want to say it? Because I'm fucking awful at this. <laughs> They're going to fire me and hire Rick. 